real big tree. Hello everybody, welcome back to a brand new episode of Business Plays. This one is, well, I always describe these as my lazy ones, where it's like, hey, what should we do? Let's do a part four. So this is part four, fake facts everyone thinks are true. Uh, Danny writes these, here's our writer. I am your boy with the blaze, I shall read it. And Sam, professional memologist, will add some fine memes. Oh, I have to say, it tells, me, it tells me a note at the top of this script that I've got to tell you about something incredible. Oh my god, are you ready? It's Squarespace. Oh, I think this is the first time that Squarespace have ever sponsored a Business Plays video. They're obviously a very loyal sponsor on lots of my other channels, so thank you Squarespace for being brave. <laughs> and sponsoring the blaze sometimes i wonder why sponsors do i guess it's because you guys actually buy their stuff which is fantastic simple acts of kindness and love um what am i talking about oh i just got a short one uh squarespace if you didn't know it they allowed you allow you to make websites it's incredibly easy you make a beautiful website with basically i, I did it for my mega projects channel it's like i mean i don't think i should describe it as no effort but uh, it looks awesome and it took like a day. Megaprojects.net if you want to see that. Squarespace.com forward slash blaze. You'll get 10% off your first website or domain. Mmm. Mwah! Let's crack on. There are some, oh by the way, if you're wondering what the hell does this have to do with business? Absolutely nothing. Welcome to Business Blaze. Uh, the, the channel's name is clickbait. Although why I called it Business Blaze and why I thought anyone would want to watch content about business I don't know. I'm sorry. Apparently I'm not as smart as I thought. So that was a fucking lie. There are some perfectly natural and simple life skills which I'm fairly embarrassed that I never admit uh, that I never managed to master. Danny, I, I believe from an early Business Place video that you you're like you're a bit older than me and you've never got a driver's license. <laughs> Uh, and I'm not even talking about anything as profoundly complicated as driving a car. Yeah, Danny. How does it, how, how do I do it? Although there's a friend of mine here uh, who will remain la nameless because, well, let's just leave him nameless. And he's tried to pass his driving test so many times and he just can't do it. And he's a bit like, he's a bit uncoordinated, I think would be the best way of describing him. Although I'd just like to put on record that even though I never managed to pass my driving test, I did hold, hold the high score on pole position down in the local arcade for three years. So who's laughing now, Simon? Well, Danny, I am. I never learned how to whistle. Oh, Danny, why? I had to learn how to whistle for obvious reasons. <laughs> Mr. Sandman. <laughs> I don't know why that's what I chose. Excuse me, what are you doing? I wasn't for lack of, it wasn't for lack of trying. I just never seemed capable of doing anything other than blowing out disappointingly unmelodic hot air. I can never blow bubbles with bubblegum either. Could do that as well. Come on, Danny. Again, I put in the effort, but only ever managed to spit the gum in the face of the poor soul who was trying to teach me. Maybe there was always just something a bit defective about my mouth. <laughs> Still, one thing I was really good at that nobody else could do was to crack my knuckles really loudly, even the ones on your thumbs. I mean, I could do these, but well, I just did them all. Oh. Oh, I can totally do the thumbs. How about that? And for a bonus classroom party trick, I would take my shoes and socks off and crack every knuckle on every toe to quite spectacular effect. Oh yeah. Oh, it feels good. Ah, <laughs> uh. oh. ow. Oh, okay, that one was too far. What is going on? <laughs> when I started this channel, I did not think that I'd be cracking my foot knuckles on air. Well, this is what my life has become. <laughs> Cocaine boy cracks knuckles. Sadly, this never seemed to go down particularly well with the teachers. Come to think of it, it never really went down well with anyone else either. Cracking joints or popping knuckles seems to be universally annoying to anyone in earshot. <laughs> For some reason, I just remember something we used to do at school. Like, uh, we'd just make noises. <laughs> like the teacher would turn their back and someone would just make a noise. <laughs> We're like, what the f <laughs> What is wrong with children? Weirdly, I can't seem to do it at all now. You can't pop your knuckles anymore? That's a, that's a shame. It's very satisfying. But I haven't really tried for a few decades after I was scared into giving up the habit as a kid. Oh, wait, we're talking about fake facts that everyone thinks are true. Cracking your knuckles doesn't give you arthritis. Crack away, everybody. Spoiler alert. Uh, my parents convinced me that cracking my knuckles leads to arthritis later in life. A school teacher even went so far as to tell me a long winded story about a former pupil of his who'd spent a happy childhood popping his knuckles but could barely move his own hands by the time he hit 25 and he had to give up his job as a barber. <laughs> 
This is the cautionary tale. I can see why everyone was keen for me to stop such a noisy and deeply irritating habit, and on the face of it, it's not unreasonable to assume that repeatedly pushing and stretching your joints until they crack is probably not the healthiest thing you can do to your body. I wouldn't necessarily recommend the cracking of joints. I would. It's very satisfying, especially do it in the privacy of your own home or like I'm here in my office, although then again, I'm sharing it with, with all of you guys. Welcome, but not least because you're most likely to get beaten up if you do it in public. Danny, I guess it's different in the north or in Devon where you now live. Um, I, I've cracked my knuckles many times in public and no one has ever threatened to give me a beat down. But that's obviously mostly because I'm a very scary and imposing man who people honestly just, just wouldn't want to mess with. Yeah, there's absolutely no medical evidence to support the claim that popping the knuckles leads to arthritis or in fact has any negative consequences whatsoever. Your joints are bathed in a liquid called synovial fluid, which keeps them nicely lubricated and reduces friction. When you stretch your joints, for example, when you pull your finger, the decreased pressure within your joint capsules releases gas and forms bubbles to fill up the dead space. The cracking sound is simply the sound of bubbles popping as you apply pressure on the joints. If you've ever done this yourself, you'll know that you can never crack your knuckle again straight away. You'll usually have to wait about 15 minutes for more bubbles to form. But the point is that this bubble popping has never been proven to cause anything other than ex uh, than exasperation in those around you. <laughs> has that been proven, like scientifically? Perhaps the most dedicated study into knuckle popping of all time was conducted by a doctor from California called Donald Unger, who as a child was skeptical of the repeated warnings from figures of authority that cracking his knuckles would lead to arthritis and decided to test the accuracy of this wild hypothesis. Fuck you, science! Donald spent the next 50 years of his life, I know this one, he won, a, he won an Ig Nobel Prize for this, uh, cracking every knuckle on his left hand at least twice a day while leaving his right one well alone. His findings were published in the 1998 paper in which he revealed that neither hand showed even the slightest signs of arthritis and that we've all been lied to for years. Although it's a very small sample size. I mean, I don't, look, you have to, <laughs> for something to exist, you have to provide evidence first. You can't win, you know, the onus isn't to prove the negative. So you can't start with like, yeah, it causes arthritis, prove it doesn't. But I mean, it, do, it is quite a small sample. Donald even won an award for his uh, sterling efforts, although it was the medicine category in the satirical Ig Nobel Prize dished out for unusual or trivial accomplishments in scientific research. Still, Donald was proud enough to make the journey from California to Harvard University in Cambridge, Massachusetts to pick up the award in person. Yeah, they're quite cool. I know they're like satirical, but people do covet these Ig Nobel Prizes. Heroes, and that's the only way to describe him, like Donald Unger, deserve a big, non-withered hand for exposing the myths and conceptions that have been drilled into our brains from a young age by people who really should know better. Perhaps it is because I'm afraid. And it gives me courage. And some other cases are even closer to the knuckle. Put a pull, pull. Oh, Vikings wore horned helmets. Oh, let's play the game. Do I know these to be uh, false? Yes, I did know this one. Um, I don't know when the horned helmets came around for Vikings, but it was much later. It's probably a Hollywood thing. I believe I made a video about this at some point. It's the only reason why I have knowledge. It's not like I'm well read. It's just like I'm well read because I make so many videos. I don't read. I don't even know how to read, allegedly. Uh, those seafaring Scandinavians always, always look pretty cool in TV shows and films. From the late 8th century to the 11th century, the Vikings pirated and pillaged their way across Europe in mighty longships tipped with the heads of ferocious dragons because those help. Legends would have us believe that a typical long blonde-haired Viking would swan around new territory like he already owned the place, wearing a horned helmet and swinging a giant axe. That's certainly the impression I got from my own intense studies into the Viking period as a youth, which largely involved reading the famous American cartoon strip, Hager the Horrible. Never heard of it, Danny. But I'm glad that this was your ed this is this is the extent of your education. But it's very I'm I'm, I'm pretty pleased that you learned to write. But it's pr very possible that we've got a lot of things about Vikings completely wrong. And despite Vikings wearing horned helmets in just about every visual depiction you're ever likely to see on the small screen, on the big screen, in comic strips, at the back pages of the newspaper, even in the logo of the Minnesota Vikings American football team, they almost certainly never wore horned helmets in battle. Okay, good. Being proven right so far. Legend. Uh, archaeologists have actually recovered very little in the way of Viking helmets, and they're not likely to ever find any with horns. The only- it would be a bit weird. Why are they? Why are they there? What's the point? It just seems like inconvenient. Like, you're gonna stab yourself in the neck or something with one of those at some point, or you're gonna like, I don't know. It's not convenient. Like, the number of times I've been wearing a hat and thought, this would be better with horns. Never. 
Honestly, never. The only intact Viking helmets to have been dug up to date, including one historic find just months before I wrote this script. How exciting. Are relatively simple and not particularly decorat decorated affairs crafted from iron. And in fact, most visual depictions that date back to the actual age of the Vikings see the Norse warriors either wearing a very simple metal or leather skull cap or not wearing a helmet at all. I'd be so scared to go into battle and be like, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure this is where the stuff goes on. <laughs> Want to protect this bit. Be like, yeah, 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 just throw some leather on there. Well, that'll help. It's like rugby. Like, <laughs> they wear those weird hats. Like American football, I get it. You're, you're wearing f***ing mass off, massive f off helmets because you're running into each other and smack. Although, don't they say that the helmets actually make it more violent? Like, because people are then more willing to use their head as a weapon, where I guess they're not in rugby. But in rugby, they wear like these little caps. And I'm like, what the f is that gonna do? <laughs> I played rugby at school. I f hated it because one, I don't like sports. Two, I don't like violence. And three, I generally don't like being touched. I don't want some dude like grabbing around my legs and throwing me to the ground. I'm not sure who thinks that's a good time. Like, really? Why? Stop it. There's one debatable exception. The 9th century Osberg, maybe. Tapestry features a solitary Viking dude in a horned helmet, but it's not entirely clear what it's meant to represent, and it's likely that the tapestry is just depicting a very rare ceremonial use of the helmet. There's certainly far more evidence to suggest that the real Viking warriors rode into battle horn-free. That's not to say that horned helmets were never a thing. Plenty of ancient horn, horn helmets were dug up in the 19th century, but they were all found to predate the Viking era, era originating from the Bronze and very early Iron Ages and again, they were more likely used for ceremonial purposes as they were far too thin and fragile to be much use in a fight. Didn't we say they were trying, they were wearing leather? As we discussed at length, what's that gonna do? It's like, well, yeah, once your head's cracked open, it'll keep your brain in. Yeah, but there's all sorts of skull now in your brain. It doesn't really need to be kept in because you're f***ing dead. Uh, but these discoveries seem to influence an artistic reimagining of the Vikings in the 19th century in Germany, where Norse history was becoming popular and helping to establish a new sense of German origin and identity. Artists began taking these freshly discovered horned helmets, often worn by Germanic tribes from earlier ages, and plonking them on the heads of Vikings. I love, like, archaeology of the past. It was like, yeah, well, we found this thing and we found that thing, can stick them together and call it a dinosaur, eh? Ah, the big defining moment came in 1876 in a stage production of Richard Wagner's The Ring Cycle, a cycle of four operas loosely based on the Norse sagas, first performed in full at the Bayreuth Festival Theatre, for which designer Carl Emil Doppler came up with a striking horned helmet for the Viking characters. It was a design idea that would stick with artists and filmmakers and the general public for many years to come, despite it having no basis in reality. Our Danny, there was the guy in the tapestry that one time and one time's enough. Because in a thousand years, someone will discover a business place video and be like, What the hell is even that? Whoa, sh weird in the past. All of their entertainment was like this. <laughs> that would be a f nightmare. Besides, wearing a horned helmet is a silly idea. What are you going to do with it? Quite aside from the risk of getting tangled in a tree or accidentally sitting down on it at the bar. Mm, the riskiest point about wearing a horned helmet is that you're practically giving the enemy two very useful handholds with which they can grab you and toss you back from where you came from. Oh god. Okay. So that was a lie. Uh, that's a fake fact. You know what's not a fake fact? How amazing today's legendary sponsor Squarespace is. Look, I told you a bit about Squarespace in the beginning. Let me just tell you, uh, I have my talking points. I'm just gonna riff off them because this is business place. It's how we do things. Uh, okay, so um, I'll just talk about my experience with Squarespace. I have another channel called Mega Projects where I built a Mega Projects website. So I was like, maybe some people don't wanna watch my stupid face reading uh, on a video. Maybe they just want to read the article. Sounds like, mm, I'll buy megaprojects.com. Oh, that wasn't available. I bought megaprojects.net, because someone took the com, not really surprisingly, uh, and I'll make a website. And I used Squarespace, and I went in, I loaded up a theme, it looked awesome, I created a few blog posts, I copied and pasted the scripts in, I threw in some images, and I say, you do, it's just you click where you want the image to go, <laughs> and then you click on the image on your computer, boom! Done! It's easy. And then there was also all this SEO stuff that I didn't understand, so it's like, yeah, Simon, how do you think people come to your website? They need to, if they Google, I don't know, Concord, but <laughs> I'm never gonna come up there. <laughs> but the point is, there's like that page I've got about Concord. I want people to discover it. You could do this thing called SEO, which makes it appear in Google apparently. And I'm like, I have no idea what that is. And Squarespace were like, don't worry, Simon, we got you. Here's like a giant ass page on everything you need to do. And we've got all these easy to use tools. And I was like, all right, that sounds good. It took me like two minutes. 
to figure it out and then like two minutes more to do the SEO stuff and I was like, well, that's easy. It's insanely easy. I'm sure there's some stuff I've got to say. Uh, yeah, whatever you want to do. Maybe you want to do a website like that. Maybe you want, oh, you can sell stuff. I've not done this honestly because I, I, the only thing I sell is these t-shirts and I do that through Teespring, which makes it easy. But if I wanted to print the shirts myself or if I was some sort of, you know, talented artist rather than just an internet hack, I could make a shop on Squarespace. I can sell stuff on there. And I'm like, well, that's pretty wild. And if it's anywhere near as easy as building that mega project site, you're gonna be fine. Like my grandma, she knew nothing about computers. No, she honestly, honestly, this pro probably isn't what they wanted me to say, but like she didn't know how to use a mouse. So she's not gonna be able to use Squarespace. But if you know how to use a mouse, <laughs> You're probably okay. Look, you're on YouTube. You're watching a video on the internet that's a bit crazy. You're gonna be fine. 24 7 customer support. What else? Oh, yeah, so uh, they do all that stuff that you want, like mailing lists, social integrations, blah, blah, blah. All of that website y stuff. It's, I mean, you know this. You know this. It's easy. All you need to do is go to squarespace.com forward slash blaze. You get 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. That's Squarespace. Oh my god, I really hope I talked about the things they wanted me to talk about. Uh, look, the, the biggest thing is, I use it myself. Uh, it's, it's easy. Just, whatever. <laughs> it's good. Also, it supports the show. I like it. The Earth is round. Uh, fake facts that everyone thinks are true. What? Danny, the Earth is definitely round. <laughs> in gen- The yeah, Vikings actually get a bit of tough, pre tough press in general. With or without decorative horns. They're often thought of as wild, hairy barbarians who lived in stinking huts, ate any old shit, and believed that the Earth was flat. I don't know much about the Vikings, but whenever I imagine Vikings, I imagine them like Klingons. In truth, they took excessive pride in their appearance and would piss about with tweezers and razors for hours on end. The Vikings also lived and dined in magnificent halls where you could typically find fine salmon, bear, and puffin on the lunchtime special menu. I'll try puffin. That sounds good. I've never, I don't think I've eaten bear. Obviously, I've eaten salmon. I'd try bear and puffin. Definitely. And although they may not have had a particularly sophisticated grip on basic cosmography, they probably didn't think the Earth was flat. They believed that it was made up of several different levels, all connected by a big tree. Okie dokie, what the? It's like, oh yes, yeah, science of the past. Let's make something up, and until someone proves it's not true, it's true. Yeah, yeah, there's loads of layers. How does light get down there? I don't know, it just does, doesn't it? Just does. Obviously it just does. How? Is it, I don't know, something to do with a big tree. All right? Chill out. Of course, mankind thankfully became a bit more enlightened over the passing centuries. For some of us, there are people who still believe the Earth is flat. <laughs> idiots. Smash that dislike button. And we reached a point where nobody in their right minds would still seriously believe that the Earth is flat. But then the internet came along, and quite remarkably, this new disinformation superhighway has led to a recent, re uh, recent resurgence in flat Earth nutters. This new breed of conspiracy theorists is quite difficult to engage with in serious debate. Yeah, it's why we just... I'm just like, I just make fun of you for being real dumb. As they seem quite convinced that everything they're told by government, scientists, the press, schools, airlines, astronauts, or anyone who ever, who's ever read a book is a lie. So there's little point trying to argue the case that the world is a sphere as first proposed by f***ing Aristotle. And that was a long time ago. Uh, and other ancient Greek scholars about 3,000 years ago. Can you imagine trying to explain to these guys DNA? Ah, uh, but we'd be wrong to argue that point anyway, as the Earth is not a sphere and the world is not technically round. Oh, I know what we're talking about. It's got little, I think it's got bulges at the top and bottom, right? Uh, cause it's not a perfect sphere. That, we're not saying you flat earthers are right. You're still, you're still smoking crack. The people who smoke crack are more, are more, more, have their heads screwed on better than you do, to be honest. In fact, the Vikings had it right all along. The Earth is made up of several different levels all connected by a big tree. <laughs> Real big tree. <laughs> no, sorry, I was just kidding about that last part. Danny, we knew. Uh, for, but as first proposed by Isaac Newton in the 17th century, the Earth is not truly spherical. It's actually a regular, an irregularly shaped ellipsoid. Okay. Does that mean it's got bulgy bits at the top and bottom? <laughs> Despite astronauts labeling the Earth as the blue marble, we're living on a bumpy planet with squash poles and a chubby equator. Oh, it's the opposite of what I thought. Okay. Uh, mass is distributed unevenly within the planet due to the cent and due to the centrifugal force created by the Earth's constant rotation, the planet is considerably fatter at the equator than at the poles by about 70,000 feet. Wow, that's not a joke. The bumpy shape is further distorted out of all proportion by the planet's mountains that rise almost 30,000 feet and the oceanic trenches with a depth of 36,000 feet. On top of all of that, the ever-changing weight of the tides and atmosphere which caused the deformations of the planet's crust means that the shape of the Earth is in a state of perpetual fluctuation, a bit like Oprah Winfrey. <laughs> Holy <laughs> Danny, we went there. Uh, so in truth, 
The world is neither flat nor round. It's more kind of like a dumpling that didn't come out quite right. However, I thought that the Earth is so perfectly round. I mean, like 70,000 feet or whatever is not a big fluctuation when you consider the size of the Earth. So it is really, it's, it's really round. A fatwa is a death sentence. I'm pretty sure that the word fatwa wouldn't be quite so well known outside of the Muslim world if it wasn't for Salman Rushdie in a certain book that ignited a proper storm in 1988. I feel like I know it from Homeland or like, you know, TV shows about terrorism where it's like, I don't know, there's some sort of fatwa on some dude and they have to stop the fatwa or whatever. And I'm like, okay, cool, now I know. Uh, the Satanic Verses, Mervyn Rushdie, a Whitbread book. Oh yeah, this book fucked up Salman Rushdie's whole life. <laughs> uh, earned Rushdie a Whitbread book award and a place on the shortlist for the Booker Prize, but it also earned him a fatwa and 10 years in hiding under police protection. By most accounts, it's not even a very good book, although I'll admit I've never considered reading it myself. Yeah, I couldn't have named the book. The problem was that some members of the Muslim community felt that Satanic Verses was a blasphemous piece of work which mocked the nature, uh, the divine nature of the Quran. The book was banned by a long list of countries and sparked a 10,000 strong protest against Salman Rushdie in Islamabad, Pakistan. Similar protests were held in the UK, which saw the burning of the book in the streets, and later on several bookstores who were brave enough to stock the book got bombs thrown through their windows, so you can see why some bookstores chose not to bother. Bookstores were also bombed in the US, where the FBI received a total of 78 bomb threat notifications. An article in the New York community newspaper, the Riverdale Press, defended the right to purchase and read the novel and criticized the bookstores who were chickening out of selling it. Oh, f off. If I'm some random dude who owns a bookstore and like other people are getting bombed in their bookstore, I'd be like, I'm not gonna stock that book, you f crazy. Like, I don't, I'm not gonna do that. Shortly afterwards, the office of the Riverdale P Press was bombed to bits. Early the following year, Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini, the supreme leader of Iran, issued a fatwa which called on all Muslims to assist in the killing of Salman Rushdie without delay. At this point, Rushdie went into hiding for a decade, only popping his head up uh, above the parapet for absolutely crucial situations, such as the opportunity to appear as a celebrity guest on the satirical BBC News show, Have I Got News For You? As only a kid when all of this is going on, and in my ignorance, like many others, I came to believe for a while that fatwa was a dark and sinister term relating purely to a call for assassination. But in fact, there's more to a fatwa than just a death penalty. A fatwa is actually a non-binding legal option on any point of Islamic law given by a recognized authority, and it can sometimes include good stuff. For example, in 1951, the Mufti of Egypt issued a fatwa which declared that it was okay for Muslims to drink Coca-Cola and Pepsi. That's a whole lot more fun. Yay! <laughs> Slightly more importantly than that, and that seems pretty important to be honest. Slightly more important than that, in 2014, the Indone Indonesian Council of Ulama issued a fatwa against illegal hunting and wildlife tra trafficking in a bid to protect endangered species and conserve a natural habitat. In re and in recent years, several fatwas have been issued against terrorism, suicide bombings, and the killing of innocent civilians. There have also been a few downright weird ones too. In, fa in 2012, a fatwa was issued in Morocco, which declared that man has the right to engage in sexual intercourse with his wife wife up to six hours after her death. What? Um, yeah, let's just move on. It would be fascinating to learn how they arrived at such a precise figure and why say seven hours is clearly crossing a line. Uh, and in 2007, a fatwa was issued in Egypt, which contained some good and bad news. The good news was that females should be allowed to work alongside male colleagues. Hurrah! Uh, the bad news was that females were required to breastfeed their male colleagues at least five times a day in order to create a maternal bond and eliminate sexual urges. What is this? No. Fortunately, this fatwa became, was quickly withdrawn after the public noted that it was more than just a bit bonkers. How did this get done in the first place? What is going on? As for Salman Rushdie, he was knighted for his services to literature in 2007, although I'm not sure all the bombed bookstores would entirely agree about the quality of his services to literature. <laughs> he currently lives in the US, no longer in hiding. The status of his fatwa is a little confusing. Iran has stated that a fatwa can only be rescinded by the person who issued it, and unfortunately, Ayatollah Rahola Khomeini died just a few months after issuing the fatwa. The general consensus now seems to be that everyone should just quietly forget about it, and Sir Salman Rushdie's life doesn't appear to be in any serious danger. Probably best for him not to pursue the idea of turning the satanic verses into a movie. Yeah, dude, let's just not, okay? You can't argue with scientific proof. I'm going back a while now. But in a relatively early business plays video on surgical steel and other marketing terms that mean nothing, I made a point that placing the word scientifically proven 
on your health and beauty products will probably carry a lot more weight than using the slightly flimsier term scientifically formulated. But I'd now like to take those words back and make the point, Danny, Jesus Christ, do your research. <laughs> and make the point that both terms are meaningless, as meaningless as each other. So that was a fucking lie. Because the truth is that science doesn't technically prove one damn thing, damn thing at all. There is no such thing as scientific proof. Is that right? I didn't know this. If I was overhearing a fiery debate between, say, a religious person who believes that the Earth was created in six days by God, that is a funny one, isn't it, though? Or an atheist that believes that science as much has proved otherwise, I'd naturally be inclined to side with the atheist. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it matters if you're, like, atheist or religious. You can be religious and not, like, I think most people are religious and don't believe that the Earth was made in six days. They'll be able to look at the science and be like, yeah, okay. The Earth wasn't created in six days, that we don't need to literally interpret everything in the Bible, and that we can look at the science and be like, yeah, okay, I believe it's part of God's plan. That I see as fine. Like, I, uh, personally, I'm, I don't think I'm an atheist. I don't know. I don't really believe in, like, God in the Bible or anything like that. But I mean, obviously, like, there's a lot more stuff to say that it was probably made a really long time ago by science and sciencey physics stuff going on rather than a dude in the sky. Maybe it was guided by something. Well, it's not a dude in the sky, is it? It's just not. I mean, it's not. But if the atheist begins to mock the religious person by exclaiming that you can't argue with scientifically proven fact, he's venturing into quite dodgy territory. Yeah, don't do that. I'm sure I've been guilty myself for taking the piss out of people who don't seem capable of acknowledging scientific proof and prefer instead to believe in fairy tales and conspiracy theories and infomercials presented by Kevin Trudeau. <laughs> Original business plays joke, but a bum well, I don't believe, I, so, okay, so I do know, like, it's not proof, it's just the weight of evidence. And the weight of evidence seems to be, you know, on the earth being really old on that one. But that makes a fool of me too. It, by its very nature, science is provisional and self-correcting. You're completely incapable of pro providing proof of any kind. You only really get proofs in mathematics, which offers a guaranteed and immutable conclusion. Two and two will always make five. <laughs> <laughs> Danny didn't pay attention in maths class. But sorry, sorry for. Two and two will always make four. But of boom. But science is a completely different beaker of tongs where you can only deliver a theory supported by the best available current evidence. And of course, this evidence can become rendered completely invalid with in the light of new and stronger evidence. Yeah, I mean if God came down from the heaven and was like, boys and girls, ladies and gents, uh yeah. It was six days ago. I put all those dinosaur bones there. I'm gonna prove that to you right now. Well, we'd be like, well, you can't prove it. Okay, I'm gonna provide a weight of evidence. And then he goes on to explain how everything in the Bible is correct. And then I'll be like, oh, okay, I was wrong. I don't have a problem with that. It's never gonna happen, but I don't have a problem with that. We don't have to travel too far back into history to the time when science had shown us that there were canals on Mars or that there was an extra planet in our solar system called Vulcan. Awesome. Or di dinosaurs were wiped out by an erupting volcano, or that life could just spontaneously generate without first forming from a seed or an egg, or that the volume of the universe was permanently fixed. Albert Einstein was a champion of this closed state universe theory, and it turns out that he was wrong on that one, just as all the other theories have been dismissed and superseded over time. If we're being really picky, science can't even prove if any of the facts we've covered in the last four parts of this video are fake or not. I could just be talking absolute rubbish. Wouldn't be the first time, would it, Danny? Oh, but a boom if we're patient enough, we may well see compelling new evidence which pro proposes the Vikings really did wear helmets. Cavemen lived in caves. Alcohol kills brain cells. Carrots help you see in the dark and the earth is made up of several different levels all connected by a big tree. Uh, some of these are maybe a little more unlikely than others and common sense might just play a small part, but we can never be entirely sure of anything and that's as close as we'll get to real facts in this script. Mind you, I wouldn't be all that surprised if it turns out that cracking your knuckles really does give you arthritis. Oh, that was a good callback. This has been Business Plays brought to you by Squarespace. 10% off. Link below. Uh, also, if you want to get some merch, this is available in green. Uh, Perchthemerch.co. I think I've got a green one of these on order, which I'm excited about. And thank you for watching. <laughs> Cocaine boy cracks knuckles.